scientific evidence is really um, controversial. That, that whether or not evolution from a single cell ancestry, common ancestry, is a valid point or not. Symbolic is not mythical. There are some people within the Christian camp, predominantly in the more liberal Catholic interpreters, okay, that think of the biblical creation as a symbolic event to what happened to all humanity. In the beginning of creation is very much like the end of creation. In the beginning, God was the light of the earth. Just like at the end when the look in Revelation, when it says about our Lord Jesus Christ, He's going to be its son. Animals, uh, plants, all that, death did exist as part of the biological nature. But since mankind was a special creation out of nothing, instantaneous, seven to eight thousand years ago, death did not exist until after sin and after fall. The pros and cons of the day gap. Number one, it preserves the integrity of the 24-hour period. Number two, it preserves the concept of creation by fiat, which is basically that God spoke. And they base it also on that actually the days in Hebrew are not labeled first day, second day, third day, because when you look at those first, second, third day, you think of automatically like what? A week. It's a bit of a tough argument, but that's one of the things that they do, or they interpret it. On. Last camp, and this is where the fire will begin. So don't start throwing eggs or tomatoes. The group called the, which is the theistic evolution, but the figurative, which they believe in God and natural, not naturalism, but natural laws. Natural laws, which what I mean by natural laws is like, you know what, if evolution is valid as a common ancestor and it took about five million years, okay. Scientifically, there is evidence for that. But they still believe in God. They are theists, okay. And they believe in the biblical revelation of creation, but they don't think it is literal. So this group, there is actually, within this group, three different camps. The first camp is what's called the framework. They say that creation as a story, as a narrative, was a framework because they say in the first three days, God created the atmosphere, the habitat, because in the first day, He created the heavens and the earth. The second day, He created the water above and the water below. The third day, He created the plantation. And then on the second three days, so day four, five, and six, he created the objects that inhabited this domain. So in the first one was the heavens, day one. and day four, he created the sun and the moon to be in there. On day three, he had the earth. Sorry, day two, he had the sea. So in day five, there is the fish, and then there is the birds up in the air. On day three, he created the earth. So who inhabits the earth? the animals and the mankind. So hence you see this, what's called the parallelism. First three days, and then second three days. And it's not necessarily that it is a um, time sequence, it's what's called a topical sequence. So in some sense is that the concept of the week is more crucial to the understanding. It's logical and topic. Age of the universe, it's billions of years. Genesis is not all related. It's like they're telling us, like, you know what, Genesis doesn't even answer that question. Because Genesis is not talking about time. Genesis is talking about a framework of God logically creating the universe. It has nothing to do with the age of the universe. However, they would say that still Adam is a special creation and death did exist for animals and no for man. As I said, and here are the days. So day one, is day and night, and then you got the inhabitants, which are the sun and the moon. Day two is the sky and the sea, then you've got the sea creatures and the birds. Day three is the land, and you've got the land animals and the human. And they look at this in terms of what's called kingdom model, because basically each king inhabits their kingdom. So the sun and the moon, their kingdom is the heavens, and the king is the sun and the moon. Okay, and then it comes all the way to land. Who are the who are the creatures that are in this kingdom? Are the animals and the men? There is another very interesting interpretation about this actually that is within this framework, is that the author of Hebrews, sorry, the author of Genesis, Moses, took by God's Holy Spirit inspiration, took all the major gods that were worshipped by the neighboring civilizations and put them specifically in this framework as a created entity so that they would not worship it.
This applies to the sun, applies to the moon, applies to the bird. Remember the Egyptians, they worship birds. Applies to the sea creatures, the dragon. Applies to animals, applies to the river, applies to the sea. So part of this was not necessarily to say how or when or the sequence of this creation, but rather that specifically was taking deities that were worshipped in the civilizations and make sure that the message gets that, you know what, God created them and created them in this sequence. It ties into the promise, this is another strength of this that they propose it, is that, you know what, just like God came after that in Genesis and Exodus, tied into the Israelites the idea of the promised land. He wanted to bring them to the point that, you know what, the promised land started even before that, in the creation, when the whole universe was created for who? Adam, or for mankind. And they bring this and they do a great comparison between the ancient civilization creation stories. And this is really, really tough sometimes when to, to fathom this. But when you look at ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian creation narratives, you'll find something very interesting. There are some similarities and some very, very striking dissimilarities. But some of the similarities are as follows. Is that in those similarities, man was created from dust. And in fact, in one of those, the Sumerian, okay, it was said that God, um, the God, the God, okay, did spit on the ground and created, created mankind from the dust. Number two, it is common to say that that deity did breathe into mankind. Number three, believe it or not, in one of the ancient creative narrative, creation narratives, it is said that woman was created out of the side of man. But what is different between these creation narratives of Babylonian, Sumerian, and Egyptian cultures? There are some very, very important differences. Number one, in these creation narratives, there are multiple gods. In the Genesis, it's one god. Number two, in these creation narratives, it is the evil god who created mankind. Number three, in these creation narratives, mankind was created to serve the evil god. When you look at the Genesis account, the message is totally different. And the people who propose this framework theory would wonder and say, well, did, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did that allow Moses to use the language? The language was what? Creation out of dust. The language was what? That the woman came out of the side. Okay? And use that language, but to give a completely different theological message. That it was only one God. God created out of nothing, created for good not to be a slave. And then they tie this with that the big message of the Torah is what? Is that if you stick with God, you'll come all the way to the promised land. And that started from day one when God created you. Because you also, and, and they make a very compelling case, I give you that. And some of these um, uh, people who promote this are some of the most prominent Old Testament scholars in the evangelical church. So they make a very interesting thing. They say, look at the time of when the Torah was written. If we believe it as a time of the transition of the Israelites from Egypt going into Canaan, what did they leave back in Egypt and they're going into Canaan? It was absolute idol worshiping. And when they were in Egypt and they were going into Canaan, they must have heard just living in the country of creation stories from the competing civilizations, right? And at that time they were going into one of the most civilization that had a ton of idols, the Canaanite civilization. And the message at that time was given to them, not necessarily in terms of how you were created in terms of biological scientific interpretation as we look at it or the days as we look at them, but in terms of the theological message given to them. Hence the theological message that they're purporting is that God created the framework and God created in a great sense and he put each created creature in its own right domain as a creature nothing to be worshipped and then when you as mankind you as the Israelites stick to God you'll make it to the promised land just like Adam when he was created in glory was in the promised land of his own the Garden of Eden but when he fell he got kicked out of it so this is an interesting one however what's against it Really, you know, so it's a framework theory. What does it tell us about the historicity, the historical facts? And if now you've come down to the point that there are only three days, three in the beginning and like, you know, three days, one and similar one, 
where does, how, does, how do you fit this in, that in six days God made the heavens? They would come and tell you, like, you know what, look at the theology of the message, not the fine details as you're reading in the 21st century. Now this is the last one, and this is the most controversial of all. This is purported by a guy by the name of John Walton, who's a professor of Old Testament studies in Wheaton, which is a very, 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 very um, strong evangelical seminary and school in, in Illinois. He says that it is a historical figurative that when God is making, or when the creation narrative was there, it is not talking about the material or biological origins of the creation, but it's talking about assigning it a function. And he basically bases on the fact that, you know what, when in the Old Testament you know the theology of giving a name, when, when, when God named Abraham, when God named Jacob, he gave them an identity. They did exist prior to that, but he gave them a new identity, and this identity is within serving the purpose of God. Hence, when God creates the light and the darkness, okay? And he names the, the light day and the darkness, he names it night. He is not referring to their material existence, but he's giving them an identity. What is the identity of day and night? It's time. Time. Day two, when he separated the water from below and the water from above, is he talking about the creation of the material entity, or is he giving it its identity of its function? And he said in day two, it's creating the weather. Why? Because the weather is the creation of the cycles of rain and the cycles of water between the water on the ground and the water up there. On day three, when he creates the earth and says the earth, let bring up the herbs and the plants, is creation of food. So it is not a sequence, but it's rather a creation of time, weather, and food. And he basically makes this very simple analogy. He says as follows. When you are building a house, if you are a contractor, the way that you say you're building the house, well, you know what, I put the foundation, I put the walls, I put the first level, then I put the second level, then I put the, um, the windows, and then I put the roof, that's how you build it. And then you can put a timeline as a contractor. Let's say you're an inhabitant of this house, and you would come and, and I would ask you, tell me the story of your house. What would you say? You're not going to say as the contractor, well, we you know, we did the foundation this time, and then we put the foundation, we put the first level and the second level. No, what are you going to say? We moved into the house. We put our living room over there. We put our dining room over here. We put the kids' room up there. Because at that point, you're defining what? Identity, you're defining function, but you're not defining the origin and the existence and the material existence of that entity. And that's what he said, that's the difference between a house and a home. John Walton's theory comes down to one basic fundamental point. He says that Genesis 1 and 2 is not a story of the house in terms of creation, in terms of its material existence, in terms of its when did we dig the foundation, when we put up the first floor or the second floor. It is a story of a home. When did it become functional? What does this mean? Well, his interpretation is very, very, very much with, you know, an age of universe of um, billions of years. In terms of Adam, and I'll come to Adam actually in, in a little bit, that's actually a, a totally different story. But it could be ex nihilo, it could be instantaneous, it could be in a moment. It could be exactly as young earth creationists will believe it. But it also could be through a natural process. Adam and Eve are archetypal figures. What does that mean is that Adam, also the whole story of the house and the home, Adam was not identified as Adam, as the biblical text talks about it, until God gave him that identification. But it has nothing to do with his biological upbringing. Is this a creative way of interpretation? <laughs> I think so, it is. But what is really 
important about this is that this interpretation by John Walton has become the adopted interpretation of the whole camp of theistic evolution. If you th I just mentioned to Francis Collins, okay, if you look at that website, biologos.com, that whole camp of theistic evolution adopted this interpretation. Are they, you know, taking something that really appeals to them and, and saying, well, you know what, this is, um, you know, what we like? Is this concordism? Could be. But what is John Walton getting all this from? You know, he's done his homework. In fact, he's written four books talking about ancient civilization, ancient creation narratives, about the creation narrative of the world, and then Adam and Eve. His last one is Adam and Eve. And very, very interesting research there. And he says that basically it is giving the function and the role, not the existence. And in fact, he talks about that God created this universe so it would be his, he calls it the cosmic temple. That God created this for, to have an enjoyable relationship with Adam. And this whole purpose of this creation was that the Garden of Eden will be created while he will meet man. And man will meet God. And where does man meet God? In the temple. So he calls this whole creation the cosmic temple. And he makes it kind of based on Solomon when he dedicated the temple. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple? And he says that the Garden of Eden was the meeting of God with man. Not God's, I'm sorry, this is a typo. But meeting of God with man. The strength of the historical figurative. Very, very, very appealing from a biological standpoint of the creation of man. Except, who are Adam and Eve? I would preface by saying that Adam, yes, there is, they, you know, John Walton has some very strong argument who said that, you know what, Adam and Eve are Hebrew names. And if we realize that even if you retroject until 7,000 years prior, that the Hebrew language did not even exist. So how can you say that they had a name in a language that did not exist? I'm going to say it again. How can you say that those two people had a name in a language that don't exist? That is one of his claims. And in fact, he said that the Adam and Eve as a Hebrew word are a generic for man and mother of all living kind, which denote our description. Okay, every man is a man. Every woman is representing female, which that every single mankind, every single living being, had to come from a woman. So they represent them as a nature. But it's very problematic because then is Adam and Eve historical figures? What is death? So creation of man is one of three options in these interpretations. Either special creation, which the young earth creationists and most of the old earth creationists would hold to, okay? Or miraculous modification, which is what the ID, the intelligent design, would hold to, that God at the right time did a certain modification of mankind to make him who he is. Or evolutionary creation, which is the theistic evolution camp, that basically God patiently waited for mankind to evolve from the biological process and mechanism called evolution until the point that he was intelligent enough to have a relationship with God. So those are the three camps. This is my last group of slides. And this is where it comes to be very, very, very controversial. Because no matter what you believe in terms of the creation of universe and you feel comfortable with that, when it comes to mankind, it becomes very hard to interpret because it's either one of two things. That mankind, in terms of the biblical Adam and Eve as we know it, is either seven or 8,000 years old, okay? Or it is ancient as biological ancestry population studies tell us that they're 150,000 years old. And now you're going to have to put on your biblical and theology hat and see these possibilities. First possibility, that they are a pair, there are two. And by the way, the biological um, population studies tell you that based on our genetic diversity, it is mathematically impossible that all this diversity would have come from only a pair based on the mutation rate of genes.
That is what a mathematical biologist and geneticist would tell you. So here are your options. Number one, that it's a pair of recent ancestors, less than 10,000 years, which is the historical Adam and Eve, which is adopted by young earth creationists and progressive creationists. Option number two, a pair of recent representatives among humanity, because you can fathom that, well, you know what, you've got the population that tells you that they had to be 10,000 people. Those were the original ancestry of humanity based on our genetic diversity. So you can make a potential hypothetical solution that there is a group of humanity, and out of this humanity, God chose two who are Adam and Eve, and through those two, the biblical story starts. So that's the second possibility. But still, Adam and Eve per se are a historical pair among humanity less than 10,000 years. Option number three. You've got a pair, still a pair. So it would be true to the biblical story that they're a pair. But because of the genetic diversity and the way that we're looking at human genetic population, they have to be ancient more than 150,000 years ago. Or a pair of ancient representatives among humanity. You all know when I talked about the bottleneck population that was thought about 10,000 population in Africa about 150,000 years ago. By genetic modeling, that's what they think is the origin of mankind. So that's the fourth possibility. And the fifth, which is kind of interesting, that is adopted by several Catholic scholars and Russian Orthodox scholars that this whole story of creation is symbolic of every one of us. And in fact, I was actually, you know, talking to a couple of people, there is actually a couple of books in, in Egypt, in Arabic, from um, Jesuit scholars, okay, that talk about this, you know, um, Henry Boulad and Costa Bandeli. They're actually, that's what they propose, that this is not a story of biological origins as much as a symbolic story of every one of us. So these are the five competing theories of Adam and Eve. Now, the theological challenge, no matter what stance do you take, you're going to have to answer these questions in your mind. You have to do your research. You have to go back to your biblical studies. You have to go back to uh, the people you discuss with and have to be honest with yourself. What does it mean to be created on God's image and likeness? Just like the question that was very appropriately mentioned, does the image and likeness mean our physical nature? Because if it does, it is incompatible with anything that Adam could be less, could be more than seven to eight thousand years. If image and likeness is God's spirit in you, it's your free thinking, is your creative will, then biologically, biologically, you could have evolved in whatever shape you have evolved, and at the right time in history, God breathed the spirit on you, and that spirit is the image and likeness of you knowing God. That is the more liberal interpretation, as I said, from some Catholic scholars and Russian Orthodox scholars. But number one, what does it mean to be on God's image and likeness? Number two, how does God participate in our creation at this point after Genesis? Believe it or not, the same debate of how God created us is the same debate, how does God interfere in your own creation at this point? Can anyone tell me? Because if you would say, well, God at this point, um, I'm born from my mom and dad. You know, a sperm and an ova came together and I am there. It's a biological process. And then this is where the body comes from. But what about the spirit? Is the spirit a biological phenomena or not? Well, if it is not a biological phenomena, okay, and listen to this, it's very tough. When does God put the spirit in the embryo? And does God put the spirit in the embryo? And if God creates the spirit in each single embryo, is it created in a sinful state or an un or an innocent, unsin state. If you'd say it is not in a sinful state, well, how can we say that we are born with the corrupt nature? If God creates us in our, our own, that's me, if God creates me with the sin, well, really, is that what God does? That's impossible to believe. So the whole creation tension about the body and spirit, and knowing that the body can come from biological means, and the spirit comes from God, even comes to the point of us being created. How does the spirit come to each one of us? How does the sin come to each one of us? And a very simple answer that a lot of people say, well, you know what, God creates the spirit free of sin, but then the body is, you know, where the sin is. But you know what, this is the Gnostic philosophy.
Gnosticism that matter is evil, but the spirit is from God and has no evil. That's problematic. So believe it or not, within Christian bioethics, there is a ton of debate that has lasted for centuries. Revolving around this point, how does God create us at this point? Is it totally a biological phenomena? Or does God interfere at this point in every single creation in this world? And I can tell you, the debate between Christian scholars is on both sides. Christian scientists who would believe that man evolved from biological um, you know, precursors and God breathed the spirit of life on them at some point, and that was God's spirit, not the biology. They would believe that actually, you know what, I don't see anything wrong with the conclusion that we are, when we're born, okay, we're born through this natural biological process. And then we get the spirit from God at some point. So you see how your understanding of creation even comes to the point of where you're at now. Number three, how does sin get transmitted from generation to generation? And then how do you interpret death? How do you interpret death? So how you interpret death is very clear because you know what? God, so here are the people that, like the young earth creationists, they would say, well, you know what? It was a spiritual death and a physical death. The people on the figurative side, they would say, well, when God said, when you eat of the tree, you shall die. Did Adam die? Right there? No. So they would claim, well, it is spiritual death, which is expulsion from the Garden of Eden, not physical death. Hence, Mankind was not created immortal. Hence, death as a potential possibility could have existed prior to fall. Sometimes this feels for us really strange, but then they would be the very first to argue with you. If man was created immortal, why was there a need for the tree of life? So then it becomes a little bit more nuanced. Was man created immortal or was man created with a potential of immortality and it becomes very hard because you know what if you take the theistic evolution who said that man evolved and death existed the people before me all were dead and then the people around me let's say I'm a representative among the whole humanity could have died why were Adam and Eve chosen? They would tell you, well, you know what? The Bible has a story of the chosen people. He has a story of Abraham. So God could have chosen at that time, and that's actually John Walton's viewpoint. I don't buy it that much, but I think it's very creative. That he would say that out of mankind, when mankind evolved from 150,000 years to the point of seven, 8,000 years, when they were intelligent enough, spiritual enough, understanding enough, God chose a pair called Adam and Eve among humanity at that point. And he asked them to be representatives of humanity to bring God to this group, to bring order, to bring harmony, to bring relationship. And they were given a chance of immortality by their access to the tree of life. However, because they sinned and they wanted to become on their own and they wanted to become gods in their own eyes, they were not given access to the tree of life, hence biological mortality, which was in them before, reigned in them. And because of this, they lost the chance for all humanity to be, at that point, part of the Garden of Eden. Do I think this is very creative? I think so. But that's how he interprets it. Last slide. If you would go with the group ancestry that mankind was... 150,000. Here are the challenges that you have to answer in your Bible. What do you make of the genealogies of Adam in Genesis 7 and Luke 3? By the way, Luke 3 traces Jesus Christ all the way to whom? To Adam. So if you think it was a group and it was not just a historical Adam, there was not a single Adam and a single Eve. If you think it was a group of people and Adam and Eve were representative of a group of people, how do you make sense of these genealogies? They don't make sense at that point. It becomes very hard to incorporate them. How do you make sense of Genesis 2.5? Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. I find this verse very hard to reconcile with John Walton's theory of 
Adam and Eve being representatives of humanity who were chosen by God to be in the Garden of Eden and lead people into Garden of Eden. I find it very hard because you know what? It's clear from this verse that there was no other man. There was no other humanity. How do you make sense of Acts 17 that it says in here, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. But I'll give you this, and I was talking to uh, Dr. Haney about this. Actually, in the Greek language, in the Greek text, the original text, which, you know, this is how hard it is, that sometimes you have to go into the Greek to learn the reality. The word man does not exist. It's actually from one, he made all the nations of the earth. Hence, you find some Bibles, like the King James Bible, like the RSV, would actually say from one blood, he made all mankind. You find the NIV, the NASB, and a lot of other Gospels, their translations, would say from one man. But you can see how one word can make it very difficult to interpret. Because if it's one blood, well, you know what, yeah, we all share the same blood. And that could match, a group ancestry could match 150 thousand years ago of 10,000 people to be the ancestry. But from one man, man, that's hard to argue against. But that tells you how hard it is. And then this is above all, the toughest of all. How do you make sense of Romans 5.12? I'm not telling you that these people are, are dishonest in their research, but I'm telling you that they have to struggle with these verses. And if you adopt their interpretation, from the Catholic liberal side or the, the liberal orthodox side like in Russia or John Walton, these are the verses you're going to have to make sense of. When it says, therefore, just as sin entered through the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. When you read John Walton's book, and he's such an amazing scholar, he says, well, yeah, you know what, I can understand this because for me, Adam was a representative. And as a representative, okay, when he sinned, unfortunately, he prevented all humanity from um, access to the tree of life. So after that point, death, but it says death entered, okay? But at this point, he say, well, death at that point was established. There was no chance of it reversing until Jesus Christ came. But then how do you go into 1 Corinthians chapter 15? The first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. But John Walton and people like him would be first to say, well, guess what? Christ was not the last Adam. This is figurative speech. So what he's saying over here is that not the first humankind sin, because the last human, you know, life-giving spirit, Christ is not the last human. But it says that in us, in the origin, when we created, okay, we sinned. The first man sinned. And in the origin of our nature, that sin existed. And that's why Christ came. But then you'll ask the question, well, Professor Walton, you're saying that there's a possibility from a biological standpoint that humanity existed for 150 years, okay? And they went through biological death generation after generation for 150 years, 150,000 years. And then about 7,000 years ago, which is considered the biblical time, all right? At that point, God chose Adam and Eve as representatives for humanity to have that relationship with humanity. What was the status of the rest? Were they judged? Were they sinful? Were they, did they die? What happened to them? What, you know, what is their status? Where is even Christ from them? Where is God for them? And he would cite, and I think this is really a bit of a stretch, but he would cite Romans 5.13, to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. From his perspective, he says that the people who lived prior to Adam, so from 150,000 years until to 7,000 years, were not held accountable for their sins because there was no law and there was no communication from God. The people who lived with Adam at that 7,000 years were not held accountable because of that. Because there was no law. But then once humanity got the revelation from God in the form of God's spirit who gave to Adam, humanity became accountable. I think that's a big stretch. I think it's very hard to reconcile. I think if you look at the end, at the lay of the land here, you have the historical literal and you've got the historical figurative. I believe if we're really honest to the text, 
we would have to admit that God has a certain kind of special something. I don't want to jump and call it creation or evolution or evolutionary creation because you know what, just like somebody else said in the beginning, we can play with terms, whatever we want to fit our own agenda. But there is a, no doubt in my mind, a special thing about humanity. And there's a special thing about sin in humanity. And there's a special thing about being distanced from God in humanity, whether it is spiritual or physical. And there's a special thing for that has happened. Otherwise, why would Christ need to come? That is the whole point of Paul's epistles to Romans. Why would he need to come? So is this easy to convince somebody outside of the church? No, it's not. It's very hard because, and that's why I think the first lecture, the one that we had earlier today, is for people outside of the church. But this lecture is for people around, for here, who actually read the Bible and want to make sense with the Bible. But then you have to determine, you remember that analogy I gave of the railroad? Okay? You can go and study your science and make up your mind from a scientific standpoint and that will be one track of the railroad. But then you have an equal and arduous task to come on your biblical side and your theological side and match them. If you believe that God created Adam in a special creation, then I think it will be very, very hard to reconcile it biologically with man evolving from precursors. If you think that God gave the spirit to mankind at a time in man's history when they had biologically evolved from precursors, then that would be more plausible for you. But then you have solved the problem in Genesis. You have not solved the problem in Romans. And I think this is where John Walton's book becomes a really a problem. John Walton focuses so much on Genesis that he wants to resolve the conflict in Genesis between the Genesis account and evolution and creation. But then from a theological standpoint, you have to come and ask him, well, it's like, you know, Professor Walton, what do you think then of the need of Christ? Why did Christ come? Why did Christ's blood was there? Why did the sacrificial system that was based on a symbolic sense to bring the sacrifice of Christ, why was it needed? You have to tie in your Old Testament and your New Testament. As I said, and I will, you know, have to admit this because a lot of people ask me this. I think from a biological standpoint, there is a lot of evidence of evolution from common ancestry. I think the mechanism is still very debatable. Whether it is absolutely, completely random mutation or intelligent design. And in all honesty, when you look at the science, I think the science is out there for both of them. And this is from the scientific standpoint. But I do believe from a theological and a biblical standpoint, there is a special status of creation of mankind. I believe that the link between both of them is yet to be revealed to us. We might know it one day when we're in this side of heaven. We might never know it until we get up there. But in the end, it's not shaking my faith that God still, despite the mechanism might differ, God created it all, created for good, and created man for glory. My urge to you at the end of this talk, if you are struggling with the scientific aspect of evolution, and to the point that it, feel, it seems to you that it's implausible to believe otherwise, that man has evolved from precursors or common ancestry. I would tell you very, very much like so that you are in a company of some very, very prominent scientists and prominent Christian theologians who are struggling with the same debate. Go and read their work and get oriented. But in the same time, read the opposing view. One thing you would realize from my presentation, I gave you both views because we have to respect and learn both views. I think if you want to hear a little bit more about our tradition as a church, our tradition as a church has been primarily that the creation, the universe, definitely can follow the outlines of what science is telling us. But when it comes to man, there is a certain mystery that we just don't know enough about. And I think the mystery is not only in his biology, 
I think it is in his spirit, in his sense, in his mind, in his intelligence, in his creativity, in his emotions, in his relationship. It is unbelievable and it's so complex. And I think this is where God's image is unbelievable. So go and do your reading and don't stumble because you can't fit them both together. Know you are in a good company of that. And don't let anyone who would come and tell you, if you would endorse evolution as a biological standpoint, you cannot believe in God. I don't think that's true. I think science is amazing in the mechanism. I think faith is amazing in its revelation. And to be a complete person, you have to put both in the same part. I take that the special creation is very special. I'm going to skip over these, but you know, I had some um, scripts from the church fathers. The church fathers are a little bit hard in this, and uh, you know, you got to give them a break because <laughs> they didn't know in terms of a lot of the science that we have. But the church fathers, as I said, there are two groups. St. Basil and St. John Chrysostom are very much in favor of the young earth creationist. St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Augustine, maybe St. Athanasius, but I, I'd probably say St. Gregory of Nyssa and, and Augustine are more of the day age, where the universe is prolonged periods of time. But I do believe that both of them believed very strongly in, um, in creation, special creation of mankind. If you want to have a very, very, very good book that really goes into the patristics of this from an orthodox standpoint, there's a book by Father Seraphim Rose. It's that thick. And he goes into details very much about the patristic writings in this. Thank you for your time.